Wahegru Ji Ka Khalsa, Wahegru Ji Ki Fateh. My name is Manthir Singh. I'm here from uh, Detroit, Michigan area. Um, my wife, Jasu, is here, and I got my three kids, Gesar Singh, Hanurkor, and Baj Singh. We're all attending together. Um, I specifically wanted to come to the Sikh family camp this year because I attended the Singhs camp in the summer, and I really enjoyed it, and it was a lot of fun. And I felt like we had a great chance to talk and discuss. So I was really excited to come back. So I'm glad we're all here together. Um, this presentation that they assigned um, from the camp, they wanted to talk about the love and tolerance theme, but kind of in the Pantic realm. My presentation isn't gonna specifically be about that. What I wanted to talk about is this word I made up called perspective. It's the Guru's perspective. And the reason I'm calling it that is because from the Panthic point of view, there's a lot of different ideas and views in the Panth. And maybe if we can take the Guru's perspective, we can be a little bit more tolerant of each other. Okay? So that's the idea. All right, so basically what is perspective? And I did the classic, you know, pull up the definition and the dictionary and what does it say? Um, specifically, there was a couple of definitions, but in relation to this, the interpretation, or inter, I'm sorry, the interrelation in which a subject or its parts are mentally viewed. So perspective is what you think when you see something in relation to something else. And a lot of the scientists and psychologists that work on concept of perspective, they really say perception is reality that what you perceive is reality because you act on what you perceive. It's, n it's not a metaphysical definition, right? So the idea that this bench, we call this a bench uh, because we can sit on it. It's it sits on the ground and then we sit on it. There's a relationship there. So that's the perspective of how you would view something like this. So. The idea that things are what we think they are and not what they really are. That's what perspective comes down to. And one example of how perspective can change on something is, let's say you're eating a delicious meal in a beautiful restaurant and you, know, you go home and you talk about, you're like, God, that place was great. We've got to go there. We've got to take this person, whatever, because the food was amazing. But if you ate that same food, the exact same food, and the restaurant was just a mess. You can see the people, the people that are cooking the food are smoking and there's dirt on the ground. Your silverware is dirty. Your waitress is rude. Your perspective on that same food changes. You can actually, the food can actually start to taste bad to you, even though it's the exact same food because your perception changes, right? So we kind of want to use this idea of how, being aware of how we perceive things and what reality is. I did this riddle already at the Sings camp. So if you were at the Sings camp and you already know this riddle, don't say nothing. But, and I'm gonna do this one quickly. I'm building this house and all four walls are gonna face south. Is that even possible? Am I wasting my time? Anybody have a guess? I don't wanna spend a lot of time. So if you have an idea, just say it out loud. It's not possible, right? It's not possible still. I built the house on the North Pole. Every wall faces south at the North Pole. All I did is I gave you a perspective. Something that seemed impossible. It actually seemed extremely impossible. Not only that one direction is south, the other direction, but that's also south and that's also south. But now you have a perspective and you changed. And now it's so obvious that you can build a house with four walls facing opposite directions and they all face south. So along this idea, this, this diagram here shows how people talk about what is true. We have this cylinder in this corner with light shining on it in two different directions. People say, look at that circle shadow. That's the truth. That's a true shadow of that cylinder. But then you look on the other wall and it's a square shadow. Now, if you are the person that is only looking at that circle on the wall, you could guess that the object must be a sphere. And if you hadn't even thought about the idea that it could be a cylinder with a square shadow, 
you would argue with that person that they're saying it's a cube and you go, no, it's a sphere. I can see it's a round shadow. And the other person is saying, no, it's a, the shadow is a square. It's got to be a cube. Okay, until they step back and see, oh, we're looking at the shadows of a cylinder. So I change those truths to perspective. Those shadows are actually your perspective. The truth is the cylinder in this example, but the perspective is the shadow you were looking at and the information you built in your head about everything based on that, right? So that's not true either. <laughs> it can also be a third thing that can give a triangle shadow. It's not always a dichotomy. It's not always a duality, pick one or the other. Sometimes there can be more things that we aren't considering. So even if we figured out, oh, here's an object that makes a circle shadow and a square shadow, it must be a cylinder. Well, it could be something else with this oblong object in the middle that also has a triangle shadow. It's not a cylinder. So now all three of those perspectives have a truth to them. Similarly, <laughs> Donald Trump is standing there and looking at the sun rising in the east and settling in the west, and he goes, yeah, come on. Look, the sun goes around the earth every day, okay? It's the biggest sun, it's the best sun. <laughs> right? You gotta we need to build a wall. <laughs> so China. he's not wrong from his perspective. He's standing here and he, we all watch it. We actually watch the sun move across the sky, right? And so it's easy for people many hundreds of years ago or whatever to look up in the sky and go, okay, the earth is at the center of the universe. The sun goes around, the moon goes around, and even the stars are kind of going in some pattern around. So the earth must be at the center, right? But what do we know? In our solar system, what? The sun is at the center, right? So this is what they call a geocentric theory versus heliocentric theory. It used to be that everybody, they'd make models that the Earth is at the center of the universe. Then they said, okay, we have a solar system and at the center of the solar system is a fixed sun and now all the planets are going around, right? So how many people agree with that's true? The sun is fixed in the center of the solar system and the planets are going around. Okay, some people, I see some people shaking their heads. Some people might know that the sun is actually moving. It is moving through space very fast and the planets aren't going around it like in a perfect circle around. They're actually trailing behind. It's like this big helio complex thing moving through space. And the, they know this because they can measure the speed of these objects relative to each other, perception. And it goes back to the Big Bang Theory. And I'm not gonna get into whether we believe the Big Bang Theory is right or wrong, but it's the most prevalent theory on how the universe started. So I just want to make a point about the Big Bang Theory. If, many of you probably already know this, so just I apologize if I'm repeating something, but in the Big Bang Theory, it, it, an atom, you know, all these objects are made up of atoms and molecules, correct? And the atom has a nucleus with electrons and things spinning around it, right? Most of that atom is empty space. The objects that are spinning are very tiny. And the atom, just I'm making up, a, let's say this is the size of the atom, most of that is empty space. In the Big Bang Theory, the entire known universe was compressed into a ball this big. And it was unstable. It was so much energy and mass compacted into a little ball. It sat there and it got so unstable, it just blew up. The Big Bang, big sound, beginning of this universe. And things just went flying out for trillions of years now. And they're still going. There's the, we know the universe is, well, I don't want to say no. We perceive the universe to be expanding because we're measuring things and we're showing that it's expanding. And we expect in the next few billion years or whatever, it's going to start contracting again, contracting, contracting. All those gravitational forces are going to come back back to this one little ball, and then that ball's gonna sit there, it's gonna become unstable, it's gonna have to expand again, and it blows up. So, that's why the sun is moving, because that, from that explosion, everything is still moving out away from the center of that creation, of, the, of this universe. So the sun is moving, 
the planets are moving like behind it, spiraling around. So, you know, it changes our whole perception of our own solar, solar system. So I'm thinking about some of this stuff. And then when you try to read some things in Gurbani, sometimes you come across things and then you wonder, okay, is this a truth? Or is this an analogy or what? So Jare Kunda Palia Sun Sabin Avranajai. Okay, Jare Kunda, I mean four corners. Don't we know this to be true? So why would Gurbani make a reference to four corners? Anybody wanna take a shot at that or guess or make a comment? And again, I don't assume to be right about anything. It's like Virji had said before, we just share kind of what we learn. I could be completely wrong on this. So if you have some insight into why Gurbani would use a reference like Jare Kunda and we know the earth to be a globe. You could use a uh, uh, example like Jare Kunda because like, there's like four directions in this whole world. So like everybody's coming from that different perspective. So okay, so he said there, there's four directions. Well, I know there's a north point and a south point. Where are the east and west points? To have a corner, you know. Anybody else? I believe uh, Gurbani, it's, uh, it's uh, some things uh, Gurus have got from mythologies and Hindu stuff. And for example, Tarasila Kujumma. Uh, so it's like just a reference kind of that it means. Uh, because, maybe because, everything. yeah, because maybe because all the people in those days, they believed the earth to be a flat thing and maybe it's reference to that. That's the explanation I always accepted, right? Until I looked at a map and I imagined people that are searching for treasure and they roll their map out and they go, man, we've searched all four corners of this map. And then I started to feel like that felt genuine to me. So going from, oh, this is just a reference to something, an analogy, don't take it literally. Then I went to, oh, wait a minute. It could be literal like we sometimes jump to these conclusions too easily because we think we know so much i don't know that that's what this reference is for i'm just saying all of a sudden this clicked with me that looking at a map you'd look at all four corners i searched all four corners of the world and found didn't find what i was looking for good lord all right so Another example of perspective. I know a lot of you said you are not movie buffs, but many of you were, so follow along and see what you think about this. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a story about this very clever guy. Um, he was in the Senate a long time ago, and he set up this idea that I'm gonna take over. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create uh, a blockade on the Trade Federation to a specific area. I'm gonna stop them from being able to trade with everybody else. And I'm gonna force the queen in that area now to sign a treaty saying that they will no longer, you know, deal the way they're dealing. And I'm going to come up with a vote of no confidence in the Senate against the current chancellor because the chancellor is, is weak. He's weak and he doesn't do his job. And this is why we have this trade federation problem, this blockade. He doesn't tell anybody that he set up the blockade. He did that secretly behind the scenes. And then he had a fellow senator nominate him to be the new, the new chancellor, okay? So now he becomes the new chancellor and he declares emergency powers, takes control of the military and builds an empire by enslaving all the people. What movie am I talking about? Star Wars. Does that sound like Star Wars to you? Well, to somebody it did, right? But that's actually the plot of the um, uh, prequel movies of Star Wars. Phantom Menace, Phantom Menace uh, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. But we don't think of the story that way. We think of it as space, lightsabers, fighting, Jedi. Oh, the Jedi are just like the six, you know? Yoda, he's Joda, you know? So uh, this, this, is what we, this is what we get caught up in. We get caught up in the illusion being created in front of you when there's actually a real plot happening behind the scenes that's pretty sophisticated political plot. And it actually gives us a lot of lessons about the real world politics. Another perspective on the same movies. 
a young innocent boy goes to train to become a warrior. His attachments to his mother, his wife, um, his jealousy of his mentors and his peers drive him to turn against the people that trained him and destroy them. And in the end, he seeks redemption through his son who reminds him of his good and brings him back to the light. That's also Star Wars. That's the story of Darth Vader. But we don't think of the movies that way. So again, I'm just bringing this up as an example. So that's the Star Wars movies. Okay, so we're going to do our first exercise now. And what I'd like to do is, I don't want to spend a lot of time, we don't really have a lot of time to go into the exercise, so we're going to break up into groups. And I'm just going to say whatever table you're at, just maybe these tables will sp spread out a little, we don't want just two people here. So maybe you guys can shift over. But um, we're going to break up into groups. And just bear with me, there's a reason I'm using this example. We're going to talk about, do human beings living in any country today have the right to own guns? Yeah. So the Mughal Empire says, you are not allowed to have, Guru Gobind Singh, That's you right. specifically are not allowed to have guns. That's okay, but you just said. But the, we're saying, the perspective we're taking, your person is a messy, unstable, and then. But as, again, the government is defining who's mentally unstable. Aurangzeb is going to define Guru Gobind Singh as unstable and unfit to own a weapon. So should he turn over his weapons? Okay, so in Canada, your laws are different than in America, right? Yeah. Right, you're still allowed. But if they decide six weren't allowed to, what would you do? Yeah, so what would you do? Protest. Okay. All right, good. So that, that's part of my question I was going to ask. Is it okay? But let, let me hear from the next table, and then I'm going to ask the, this next. Okay, this table here. What did you guys? No, we, were, we were just, yeah. <laughs> we hadn't even come up with a conclusion. We would still well, we, we, we were, we were to agree that, yes, you do have the right, right. but it takes like a certain type of person probably like, who should own a gun? Probably like a Dharmic person. Now, how do you decide somebody, are they trained in a certain way or something like that? That we don't know, right? So that's, I guess, uh, we were trying to discuss. Yeah. Okay, next table here. <laughs> this table here, Anji. From Guru's perspective, yes. Yeah. So what do you do if the government says you can't? Would you break the law to own the gun because you believe Guru says it's okay? Uh, no, we would pr protest and then uh, um, I mean, fight for it and then... Uh, okay. All right. This table in the front. What do you guys... Huh? It's okay. And you guys are pretty much all on board. Everybody's good. You can have them, and if the government tries to take it from you, overthrow them, overthrow them or, or most oh, likely, wait, oh, hey, hang on, most <laughs> likely, <laughs> most likely you just die <laughs> fighting. You're gonna, most likely you're gonna die. Military is gonna, or the SWAT team is gonna show up, and you got your gun. No, I'm saying regardless. Oh, okay. But in Guru Sahib's time is an example. Okay. Yeah. All right, this, la this table here, what did you guys come up with? Right. Yeah, you want to add to that? Go get that cube out of the van and bring it with the bottom facing down. You do have a right to own, can you say it again? You do have the right to own guns, it's just that there's some people um, trying to stop you, say if there's a bill on six for owning guns. Yeah, so in that case, you say, rise up, protest, yeah. fight for your rights. This table? Wait, wait, hang on, hang on, sorry, one second. Okay, so let, let's just say, let's bring it to modern times with the same enemies. ISIS takes over an area in Punjab, 
predominantly Amr 36. ISIS has taken over. They've got automatic weapons. And they put the law in place that you, not a member of ISIS, as a Sikh, are not allowed to have those weapons. So you're saying you agree that if the law says, hey, no assault rifles or no automatic weapons, that makes sense. I'd say it would be with the time. If that's the situation, then obviously the rules have changed. Then, no, of course, you should have that ability. But in peace times and things like this, for example, with what's going on in America with that guy with in Vegas and stuff like that, in peace times, it doesn't mean that he should have access to that. There's no need for him to have access to an assault rifle, you know, rifles, all this type of stuff. But if the situation changed, if it became like, you know, an enslaved state, people are attacking you, then you have the right to upgrade or whatever it is, because you got to fight fire with fire then too, right? But I, I think it comes to the perspective where everybody is not, not feeling is free. That's, that was going to be my follow-up question. Look at like some of the Black Lives Matter yeah. issues that we're having. The police are armed to the teeth and the minority communities where they're in, in, able to just do whatever they want or not. So, but the rest of America, the, what I mean by rest of it, I mean the white neighborhoods are peaceful, <laughs> right? And they're gonna say no guns. If, if, if every adult black male in America bought an assault, assault rifle today, tomorrow there would be gun legislation. Tomorrow they would be banning guns, okay? That's how that, that's how that government can work. Honey, yeah, go ahead. Because like necessarily it talks about like that freedom that you have. So like uh, since they're a bylaw not allowed to be there, so as a protector or like a citizen of that place, you're allowed to bylaw, you know, use that gun. Okay. And it, what was your guys' consensus? Um, well, I was on the phone to my wife. <laughs> and when I got off the phone, they hadn't discussed anything. <laughs> okay. And they threw it to me. So we're just going to go with yes. Yes. I, I like that. Here, bring, bring that around here. For all. These are not said they'll back me whatever I say anyway, so these are okay. me as well. We're all in this together, guys. Okay. Yes, everyone gets guns. <laughs> okay, so the reason for this exercise, I don't really care what your views on guns are. Um, what I was trying to do is, and maybe uh, Sikh camp is the wrong place to try to get people to debate whether human beings should own guns, because in general, I think we all understand the concept of Kirpan and what we've gone through in our history. Although we might argue about details, in general, people are supportive. I was hoping for some maybe antagonism there so that people had to come to, up to some kind of conclusion in a short time um, and then hear the different perspectives. But overall, that's pretty much what I expected, but a little bit more pro-owning guns than I thought it would be. So the second exercise I want to go through here kind of builds off of that. And this feeds into this whole topic that we're talking about, the, that love and tolerance. Yeah. Um, how in the Panth we can actually tolerate other people's point of view. And it, we're going to go into some of the other ideas of, um, on, on that later. But right now, I want to do another exercise. We're going to keep the same groups. And what I want you guys to do is like form a line over here. Like everybody just make a single file line and then slowly walk by. We are going to learn to build consensus in a very short exercise. This could be a huge one day long uh, workshop if we wanted it to be, but we're gonna do it in about 10 minutes, <laughs> okay? So what I want you to do, everybody just come, come by and look at this box. This is the Khalsa cube. It came from somewhere, nobody knows where it came from. It's a massive puzzle. Nobody seems to be able to figure it out. And what you're going to do is you're going to look at all the sides, but you're not going to touch this box. And the problem is we don't know what's on that bottom face. So I want you to look at these sides, these five exposed sides. Do not touch it. Do not move it, but you can look at it and then start coming up with ideas on what you think is on that bottom I need, face. I need each group to select one person to represent that group. Okay, and then what I want you to do is that one person, what do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. That one person, representative, needs to go sit at that table over there. What do you guys I need you to do that now. Pick the person and send them over there. 
Okay, we got one. One group has already got their jatida already. Okay, go sit at that table, that far table. I need more jatidars. Who's the next? Come on. You guys sent jatidars from your regions on a panthic issue, and they're going to come to a consensus and have one jatidar from that group of jatidars present what that consensus is. You may or may not agree with that consensus now because you're separated from your jatidar. But if we were to do this full workshop, spend an hour, break up into groups, lock them in a room, we would have them discuss, come back to their regions, discuss again, go back and come up with a final decision. And the reason I felt like this is maybe an important exercise we can do it here and we can take it back to our gurdwaras and our committees and try to do exercises like this, even though people are going to resist, especially we know the older generation that's already controlling the gurdwaras, they don't want to have exercises to figure out how to get along. But this kind of exercise, what it does is it shows you that we can come to consensus and we don't have to agree 100% on all of the things. We're just, a, we're kind of coming up with what's common. So now if they agree and the jatha they represent says, hey, that wasn't what we talked about. And they have to come back and say, well, this is what they said. This is what they talked about. And then we didn't even discuss this possibility. So now my challenge is to see, based on the information you guys discussed, you send your jathadars, they're going to discuss. And when they come up with the consensus, I'm going to compare it and see, were they able to successfully come up with a consensus for, for the font? Okay, so keep that up. This is that tolerance, being able to understand there's going to be people with different ideas and different perspectives, but you can work together and you may not get exactly what you want. And in a way, that's kind of what the Kaltak is. It's, it, it's, it's almost like a very, maybe very bare minimum standard that people could agree on that didn't otherwise agree. And imagine that. A Punjabi male from the 1900s who is used to making all the decisions for everybody having to accept this consensus. It's, it's a difficult challenge it's a, it, when you think about it. Are the, are the Jatidars ready? Okay, Jatidars, we're calling all the Jatidars back to meet. You have to send your Jatidar now. Or they will not be part of the decision. Uh, let, we, are, we are down to one. Go, good. But you got to convince everybody else there too. You don't have to make every decision. Every time you meet, doesn't need to be some important decision you have to make. You what don't always have to put fires up. Can you just explain on that? What are like you something to... similar to this. Now, this, this workshop I'm doing here right now is actually part of a um, old Sarbat Khalsa mm -hmm. workshop I used to do. But I changed it to a puzzle because I, I wanted to make it my own. The, the other one had different kind of jathe bandis and had to try to get them to work together. I didn't want to keep doing that be, partly because people get a little fired up. Because <laughs> it's much conflict. Yeah. And I don't want to fuel that fire. I'm trying to get people to think beyond that. So come up with any puzzle. I just made this puzzle up. I, made up a, I just made up a puzzle and I thought, okay, let me see if people can solve my puzzle. The puzzle is the problem. So come up with problems. What kind of problems happen? Like, what are the problems we have in our gurdwaras? You know, think about it. Like, sometimes somebody says, oh, we need to paint the gurdwara because it's starting to look old. Somebody immediately, who's going to pay for it? Right? That's a problem. The committee. I, but what I'm saying is, the problem is now somebody has objected. So how do you work through that objection? So you can take this type of thing and break it up. And what I did is I, yeah, I put some rules on you guys to force you. Because I was thinking really how to parallel this to Pantic level. Your Jathedars aren't able to come and discuss with you so easily. So when a Jathedar is going to a Kaal Takat and meeting with Panj Pyare or other people behind closed doors or wherever they meet and decide things and come out and make the announcement, you know, we're broken from that process. So it works at your local, that's, and that's the point here. You can work locally at your own Gurdwara, 
you can work in your region. Your region can work for your country. Each country can have representatives at a call talk. It, it's possible. You know, and it's just one idea. Maybe there's other better ideas to work it. This is not necessarily the answer. But the idea that people are forced to come to consensus is a huge thing. This is how Call Sapant works. We come up with a consensus, and then it's issued for everybody to, to follow. What I think is the uh, point that by recently made last night was who is calling us every day to the Gujarat. The problem is the anti pandit forces are coming to Gujarat every day, whereas uh, people uh, who really have pain for the Pant are like just either they are ignoring it or they are running away from the responsibility. Are probably, you know what, no one sensible is going to the Gujarat these days. So, what we need to start doing uh, on the local cases is like everyone at least go to Gujarat once. Good point. But I also want to say, let's not be so quick to jump to who's anti pontic forces. Sometimes it's another person who is viewing the Guru in a different way. They see the square. You're looking at the circle shadow, they're looking at the square shadow. And they might say, oh, Gurus didn't do miracles. There was no magic. You know, this, it was, it was, everything happened very logically. And you're in, interpreting uh, mythology and analogies into truth. And really, this is the, ultimately you can use grammar rules to come up with meanings, and that's all you need. That person is looking at the same guru, and they may be direct conflict with what you believe is actual Sikhi. Like, you, you think you know something so well, right? We, that's where our faith comes in with our guru. But keep in mind that that person is also thinking the same thing. And it's easy for both of them to call each other anti pantic One is going to say, you are influence of Hindu culture, and the other one is going to say, you are influence of uh, Christian missionaries and colonialization. And maybe the truth is somewhere else. We need to call the Jatidar of the Jatidars to come present. Okay, so the Jatidars, what I, the instruction I gave them there was, you have to come to consensus. When I checked on them, they had failed to come to consensus. So I sent them back to their jathas and said, come up with something better and then we'll discuss again. Then select one jathedar amongst the group of jathedars to be the spokesperson for everybody sitting here now. So after much deliberation, the jathedars of the jathas uh, had a very tough decision to make. And upon much deliberation, we've come to a consensus that of the, all the different options that we came back, from your jathas that we are missing some key points here. So we do have a cube with... Don't with, touch it. Oh, sorry. We have a cube. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just a humble chadu vardar of the Panth. No jathidar. Wouldn't that be amazing if the jathidar actually said that? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, this is like science fiction right now. <laughs> 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 I am not going to check the chart. So, I am going to say that this is the amazing magical cube with uh, five sides being shown to us. The concepts happen to exist uh, of Kirt Karo, Namjapo, Vanshako, the Panch Kakar, and the uh, two um, Nishan Sahib, Miri Piri. Uh, so, there are numbers on side of each cube as well, which we just discuss. Uh, uh, Miri Piri. Ten pillars. Three virtues. Ek, Char lama. Panch kakar. <laughs> panch kakar. Okay. So we did uh, discuss about it possibly being a, a sixth concept of something with a six, but uh, we we weren't able to come to a consensus of something with a six in, in the six. We do have the concept of six gurus, Bani and Guru Granth Sahib Ji. Um, after much deliberation and thinking about it, we've come to the fact that all of these concepts have to be used by Gursikhs, and so Khalsa Panth is missing. Guru Granth Sahib Ji Bani is there in the Char Lama and the Konkar. So Guru Granth Sahib Ji uh, is, is part of Guru, is there in forms, but Guru Khalsa Panth is missing. So uh, we have come to the consensus that the sixth side of this cube is Guru Khalsa Panth. <laughs> so, Bang! 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 Come on! Now, there you go. hang on. Hang on. I left it blank because I wanted it to be whatever the consensus of the font was, is uh. what the 
six sided. That's why I was pretending I'm writing call cell phones, but I didn't want to ruin my cue for the next time I use this. It's uh, on video now, you can't. No. Nah. <laughs> that would be on YouTube. <laughs> how many people said it was blank? I heard that. Now, do you feel like you were cheated by your jatidars? Yeah. That you knew the right answer. I am a jatidar. Yeah. I want to You want a jatidar? Peer you, pressure. <laughs> peer pressure from the other jatidars. <laughs> they cheated by you, not the jatidars. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I do. <laughs> um, what? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. It can be that means he needs a direct connection with so that he can listen. There's a lot of there's a lot of ways we can look at this, okay? One is who do we choose our jatidars? Who are the jatidars we're choosing? Do we actually look at these uh, things as a probable issue because there was nothing at the bottom But no, the, issue the problem the, the issue was this is a mysterious cube and we need to know what's on the, we got to decide what's on that side. That was the problem. Whether it's a legitimate problem, or not, it was still the problem and everybody worked on it. Yeah. People didn't agree. Even within the Jathadars, they were arguing. And a lot of stuff they said was really cool. I did give them hints to throw them off too. Cause they asked, they said something. They said, oh, it might have something to do with number six. And I said, oh, you mean like six gurus? Bani is in Guru Granth Sahib and then I could see that they kind of got on that trail a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing was, somebody said uh, could be Guru Granth Sahib, but I don't think Virji would put Guru Granth Sahib on the bottom and then put the box down. <laughs> and then I had to t say that yes, I would, because I am, I do all kinds of bad things that I'm not supposed to do. But I had to say that, right? Because I didn't want, I didn't want to. You're the bottom. Influencing decisions. Yes. Just to prove your point. But I didn't. I just said I would. That's what <laughs> But I, I, I hope you guys kind of saw that how, even if you don't agree with people, you still figured out how to work together because you had a deadline and you had a purpose, right? So you were able to work it even though you didn't agree. And then some people felt like, well, I was right. I wish somebody had listened to me. We still were able to work together to come up with a solution. And that's that tolerance. And that's how we got to look at it because, you know, all the different Jatibandis, we know Dhamdhamit Aksal has one philosophy, a Kankirtani Jat has one way, Sikh missionaries another way. But maybe try to look at those all as shadows of the same truth or a perspective of those truths, maybe one of them is exactly right, okay? But we should be humble enough to say that we understand that they could be right and I could be wrong. Um, okay, so, okay, we got time to continue with, all right, let me, uh, oh, I lost my presentation, hang on. Okay, I'm going to skip a bunch of these slides because I do have a lot of uh, section in here about different Shabbas and Gurbani trying to get people to get into a certain mindset, but I'm going to go ahead and skip a lot of these because we don't have time to discuss them all. <clears throat> okay, so our relative importance. Where do we fit in into Waiguru's creation? I had uh, mentioned, uh, let me see. Okay, this is a little video that's playing. It's really, don't worry about what the sound, you don't have to hear it. Just watch the video a little bit to gain perspective. That's the earth. Now remember, we're all on the earth. You got London and Toronto and New York and LA and people bustling around everywhere. But I want you to look at the relationship of the earth to the rest of the known creation, what we know through science. Right there, they just showed what the actual distance from the Earth to the Moon is. We perceive it to be close to us. But it's actually, you could fit 30 different Earths between us and our Moon, which is the closest satellite we have. Wow. 
And I'm not gonna go through the whole video because it's like 10 minutes long. Okay, so this is a picture from Mars of Earth. That tiny little speck in the sky was the Earth from Mars. So we've been able to send a robot to Mars to take pictures. So it's close enough that we can travel there. And it's a speck in the sky, the Earth. This next part coming up here is the important part that I want you to see. Because we have a space probe that has gone to the outer limits of our solar system. But it's still within our solar system, right? Oops, shoot, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, anyway, forget the video. The next thing you're gonna see is our solar system, which is our sun with the planets, inside um, our galaxy, the Milky Way, which is billions of solar systems, like ours. Billions, that's the Milky Way. That's the galaxy that we exist in. Our solar system is a speck, a little, bright speck within billions of other light specks within that. So the earth was a speck in front of the sun. The sun is a speck in front of other solar systems. Our solar system is a speck inside the Milky Way. Then they have cluster galaxies, which are galaxies like that, and then there's billions of those, okay? And this is all within the known universe, the things that we have measured and figured out scientifically. I don't know if it's all 100% true, most of it's theory, but the idea that we have been able to gather data and figure this kind of stuff out. So I was thinking about that like, we're always talking about why we should be humble. And we talk about why Guru's creation and how amazing it is, but think about that. Our solar system and our galaxy, our galaxy within other billions of galaxies, and then there are Though that grouping of clusters, there are super clusters, and there's billions of those. So the size and amazing vastness of Waigru's creation that we know about, we're not even talking about the unknown, and this is in one universe, and the creation might be multiple universes. We don't even know that. But that's the scale of Waigru's, that's why, um, how are you going to talk about Waiguru's power and his crea the creation, the strength he has to create these things? How can you even talk about it? I can't even sacrifice myself one time. You're saying whatever, whatever Waiguru wants is the right thing. Hukum pana manna. Living with inside that hukam. So now, that connection of how amazing Waiguru is and how powerful Waiguru is and how many different ways you can view Waiguru or how many different ways you can talk about Waiguru, scientifically speaking or spiritually speaking or how the Guru describes, now you start to realize who you are inside that existence. I mean, a monstrous, gigantic, planet-eating alien could chomp and eat the earth and it wouldn't even affect the entire universe. Nothing would change in the whole universe. It would be insignificant. Billions of lives lost, 
gone and destroyed, it would be insignificant. It'd be like wiping bacteria off a table with a Clorox wipe. And that's why we should be humble. <laughs> and on top of that, Waiguru gives you this thing, this process, this bani, this nam, that connects you to the entire creation. That's what, they, that's what we got. We get stuck in our head, our relative importance, our perception, our man is creating these perceptions, building those relationships, keep us focused on this thing here, and we forget that we're just a speck that can be wiped away like nothing. Right? So that's why we should be humble. And then we have those lines, Ham kire kiram sat gur saranai kar deya naam pragas. And along those lines, you know, we can, oh, there's a ham sajana ka kira line comes. But then also when we say like, me murak, me murak ki gat ki je mere ram. Um, it came last night too, hukam nama or, you know, you said it. And I thought, yeah, if I got up and said, because Virjay said, me murak, uh, what was the line? That's right. And I said, if I got up in front of everybody and said, Pai Navarit Singh is a murak. Yeah. This is, this is what would happen. And every and all of you would, guys would get mad that Manthir Singh's ego is so big that he's calling someone like him a murak. But I'll just say, I didn't call him that. He said that. He said it there. You know? But that's what Guru Sahib is doing to us. We read the Gurbani so that from out, the, the way the Gurbani is written is so that when we read it and recite it, it's now become our perspective. Guru Sahib, when Guru Sahib said that, he was talking about himself. We would never say that about Guru Sahib, right? But Guru Sahib was saying that about himself because he was recognizing as a person in this creation what his place was. So that when we say those lines, we also recognize that. This is, this all connects. The Waiguru is so powerful and so great. And we are nothing. We are bugs. We are muruks. We are actually nothing. We are insignificant in that sense. Oh yeah, and then that's the final point on that. So when you're humble, when you think of yourself like that, it's easy to accept Waiguru's hukum. It's easier to accept Waiguru's hukum. Because now you understand it's not in your control. You're not the power. You're not the, you're not the reason for anything. It's not happening because of you. So now it's easy to say, I can accept Waiguru's hukum. Is it my time to die? Is it the birth of your children? We get excited. That's all happening in hukum. All the bad things that happen in society. We talk about criminals, murderers, rapists, you know, and other even worse people. We talk about them all the time. We see them in the news. That's all happening in Waiguru's hukum. It doesn't mean that Waiguru is making it happen. It means it's happening within the structure of the order and everything that Waiguru has created. Right? Any uh, comments, questions on that? Viji, do you want to say anything on that? Anybody, anybody want to say anything in the back? Okay. All right, so that's the end of my slides. What I'd like to do now is, just very briefly, I want to throw a couple questions out at you, and then I want you to res give me a response. Just say the first thing you think of. Don't overthink it, but just, and I'm just going to kind of call on people here and there and kind of see what you think. If I said that women's rights issues like abortion may have two different ways of looking at it in Sikhi. In one way you could say it's wrong and in one way you could say it's allowed because it's a woman's health issue. What would you say to me, Benji? What would you say? To me? Yes. Thinking about women's issues yeah. and, and abortion in general. I just want to get a reaction. Just say the first thing that comes to your mind. I never thought like 
Okay. Okay. Did you want to make a comment? Um, I would want to know what's your logic behind saying it's wrong. Okay. Are you asking me that because you feel like you you already feel like it's right? Yes. Okay. That's okay. Because I'm not making I'm not making any judgment. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, but that will be you, my reaction. Okay. Yeah. Right? Yes. Absolutely. I just want to make sure I ask that before I respond. Because I don't really know, or I don't really even know if I have the right to have a say in the issue, okay? I come from that perspective. But, it's a lot of things in Gurbani talking about conception, and for 10 months, you're under Waiguru's protection for 10 months. It doesn't say for the last trimester or something. It says 10 months. That the, in, the, um, the samas, mata, udurakia, right? Udurakia. That, from the burn, burning hell of the womb, Waiguru is protecting for 10 months the individual. Um, so when I hear a line like that, I might think, well, I don't know then if I have the right to make a decision on whether that being lives or dies because I'm not in control. It's not my hukum. Even in the case of rape and incest, it doesn't make any kind of exceptions. Things that we as a society go, Oh, whoa, yeah, that was one, that's wrong. We can make exceptions here. So I'm thinking from that point of view. Yeah, I should not have gotten into this. <laughs> 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 I, maybe I, I shouldn't have gotten into this. Like pro, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I shouldn't have gotten into this because I can talk about this for hours and hours. So. No, 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 that's good. And, and, I, and the reason I asked the question is just to get these perspectives out. I'm not saying that that's what I believe and I think of abort, course, right, course, okay, I just want to make sure I say this. But we don't always think, we, a lot of times, we have our ideas, we have become fast and steadfast in our ideas, then we go to Gurbani and look for thuks that match what we think, right? We do that all the time. And another controversial one, whether you eat meat or not. I have argued with people both ways, because that's what a devil's advocate anyway. But um, I've argued with people, and I found that the people that eat meat and the people that don't eat meat often use the same thuk. <laughs> okay? And that, that can only mean one thing. It can't mean both things. Right? But that happens. Um, that's one. Um, the idea of whether you have to take Amrit as a Sikh or not, that can you just go to Guru Granth Sahib and read Gurbani and then you don't have to take Amrit. You know, we can argue about it. We can, there's a lot of points, but you can go to Gurbani and you will come up with ways to interpret the Gurbani to say, yes, you have to take Amrit or no, you don't have to. Of course, I am advocating that everybody take Amrit. I'm not, and I don't want, I don't want some of these arguments to be used against me. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying like, it's so hard when you think you've got it figured out, when you fit all your puzzle pieces together and you've said, you know, check on Amrit Vela, check on uh, Nithnam, check on uh, Kakars, check on, you know, I do Seva at the Gurdwara. And this is what Sikhi is. And if everybody just did this way of Sikhi, the Panth would be together, right? That's that idea that everybody follow one thing, like the Kaal Takat Mariyadda or whatever, or any Jatha Mariyadda. And if everybody did that, the Panth would be in Chardikala, right? But that's making everybody come together and think one way. And everybody has a different perspective. They get different, they're going to get different meanings out of Gurbani depending on where you're at in your life. You might think one thing here and that's what you needed. And then later on you might say, oh, I don't think I got that right. I actually think it means this. And it's what you need then. And it actually was right for you in both scenarios. And sometimes the Gurbani does have a temporal meaning and a spiritual meaning, meaning to it. So... That's that's what I'm gonna and again I, I didn't I don't I hope I didn't like no, not at all. Yeah, because I'm saying I that's that's why I probably should have just kept it to myself because I'm such a strong No, person. no, you shouldn't have. You know you shouldn't have. The thing I, I usually I am very confident in what's my opinion, but in this scenario it's difficult to keep in mind that you're trying to make a point. You know? So that's why that was that 
you weren't trying to debate anything. Right. Uh, which is why, and, and I, I had to make that extra effort to realize that because I was so quick to, you know, the I was going to be very quick to jump in because exactly, going back to your point, right? Like, I have established this, and it's very difficult for me to know that there might be other groups or other parties of Brian that, that might say otherwise. And what I would challenge you to do, not to change your mind, I don't, and I don't even know if it would change your mind. I'm not, I don't care about that. But what I would challenge you to do is when you read Gurbani, set your belief system aside and see what the Gurbani is actually saying to you. And then go back to your beliefs and evaluate them against it. it it's, it's, we all do it. We can't help it. You know, like when we read Gurbani, we can't help that. It's our perspective. That's, we're used to looking at that circle shadow, right? And to, to have to turn our head and go, oh wait, there could be a square shadow? And then you gotta step back and go, oh, I've been looking at it wrong. That's the difficult thing. I think it's also informed by, sometimes you're informed by kind of like how you've been trained, like, you know, if you're very scientific mind, this is the way you perceive things because that's what you've been taught by teachers or society. These are you know, your influences that you might be thinking in one way too. But like, I'll give the same perspective that well, one comment by the time uh, if, if you know, abortion might be uh, told or you, uh, you know, told or told that Right. Was it made by actually knowing, you know, sources of Gurbani, or finding out what Guru would have to say about it? Because, what time? You know, like what time do I go to? Huh? It's time? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Let's I'm gonna... Yeah, I'm gonna... That's, that's, what we, that's what we do, isn't it? We kind of make a decision for, like, right, we make a decision. And then we even yeah. use the Guru huh? according to what point we want to make. Yeah. And we'll use the Bani Punk the end. Yeah. I mean, we're all guilty of it. I mean, I think back sometimes, I think, I went to Prachar somewhere, someone made a point, and just to win the point, I threw a Bani Punk in there, which in my head I knew, it doesn't really mean that, but it sounds good enough just to win the argument, you know? Right. I'm not talking about the last week or anything, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like, like Sabah Surah the Stars, you know, something like that. Right. You know, that's a good one. Right that's now. a good, that's a whole other discussion we can have. No, that's no, a good no, one. I'm trying not to avoid <laughs> yeah. that point, but, yeah. Um, maybe a lighter topic. <laughs> um, we often do this. Either you, some people ask me, oh, do you have, do we have free will? Or is it everything predetermined by Waiguru? Well, I submit that that's a house with walls facing south. It seems impossible because we don't have the right perspective. But give up your, because if you are convinced that Waiguru does everything and we're just puppets for the puppeteer, when you go to Gurbani, you will find Pankhtiya that match what you think and then you will say them, and if the other person doesn't ha isn't as strong in Gurbani, you win the debate, whether you were right or not. And the same thing the other way. People who say free will, they go, oh yeah, it says Udham Karo, you can't do Udham if you don't have free will. But sometimes you can even accept that, I think I'm right, I believe I'm right, belief, I believe that I'm right, but I don't know that I'm right. Guru knows, why Guru knows, but I don't really know, I just believe it. That gives you that a taksali and a missionary can do things together because they're looking at the same Guru from different perspectives. But they can only do that if they say, this is what I believe, and you could be right, but I could be wrong, you know, I could be right. But for the sake of the Panth, for the sake of the Guru, we're gonna work together. And the final point here, just to wrap this up, I think this is the main takeaway from a lot of stuff we talked about with the tolerance and love, especially when it comes to Panthic things. Always think to yourself, and I think that's true when you're doing Kirtan Seva, um, Joryandi Seva, Langar Seva. Sometimes we get caught up in, oh, I'm doing, doing the Seva because people need, people need to hear the Kirtan, people need Langar, we gotta get them food. We're doing the seva for the Guru's sake. The Guru needs these sevas done because there are Sangats coming to attend the Guru's darbar, to attend the Guru's program. And the Guru needs these sevas done. That's why we should be doing these things, anything Panthic related. When we think that way, it's easier to work with other people that you maybe don't 
agree with because now you're all doing the seva for the sake of the Guru, whether you're all on the same page, maryadda wise or not, philosophically or not. 